3. Battle of Narvik When World War II broke out in 1939, Norway declared its neutrality. But the country was strategically important to both sides of the conflict, and there was no way to avoid being a target for occupation. Hitler was especially determined to capture Norway's northernmost port city of Narvik. As an all-weather port that operated through the winter while most of the Baltic Sea was frozen over, control of Narvik would guarantee the ability to receive year-round shipments of iron ore from Sweden. It would also stop the British from creating a blockade that would threaten to cripple the German war effort. The British were interested in taking the remote port for similar reasons, and because they saw it as an opportunity to shut down Germany's iron ore shipments. Ignoring Norway's insistence on maintaining neutrality, both the Nazis and the British began planning out how they would seize control of Narvik. On April 9, 1940, German forces attacked all six of Norway's main ports, marking the beginning of the Norwegian campaign. Five destroyers occupied the harbor at Narvik, and the Germans captured the port without firing a single shot. The next day, five British destroyers sailed toward the harbor under the command of Captain Bernard Armitage Warburton Lee. With little intelligence to go on, all he really knew was that a small German force had supposedly taken Narvik. He sincerely doubted that the Germans would capture the port with just a handful of troops, but was under orders to act aggressively either way. Along the way, some Norwegians told Warburton Lee about the number of German ships in the harbor. The commander realized he was outnumbered and was also worried that the Nazis had laid mines in the port's waters. But in keeping with the Royal Navy's tradition of fighting fiercely and stopping at nothing to achieve victory, Warburton Lee ordered his destroyers to proceed onward with plans to attack the better-equipped German ships at high tide the next morning. Much to his advantage, the Germans weren't expecting a counterattack, and they weren't monitoring radio communications for intel, which would have tipped them off to the enemy presence. The British vessels approached in heavy fog and snow, effectively concealing them from view, and they managed to accidentally navigate slightly off-route, which enabled them to avoid the detection of a passing German ship. Warburton Lee's forces fired first, and the British quickly overwhelmed the German ships in the port. But the commander made a fatal mistake when he decided to return to the site for a final attack. He was unaware that there were more German destroyers out in the bay, and that the ships would converge on the site right as the British approached. Warburton Lee was killed in the attack, and three British destroyers were lost. The fighting continued into late June, with the Norwegian military receiving continued support from the British, French, and Polish militaries. On May 28th, the Allies recaptured Narvik from the Nazis, marking World War II's first Allied victory and a major defeat for Germany. At the same time, the Nazis were advancing into France, and staving off the invasion was a bigger priority than maintaining Allied control of Norway. The Norwegian campaign couldn't continue without Allied support, so it didn't. King Harkon and several Norwegian officials fled to London, where they established a government in exile, and Germany seized control of Norway. If Norway did pick a side during the war, what side do you think they would have gone with? Tell us your answer and why in the comments below, and hit subscribe while you're at it. 2. Battle of Dakar After France fell to the Nazis in 1940, General Charles de Gaulle became the self-declared leader of the Free French Forces who opposed the newly installed German-backed Vichy government. France's colonial territories in Africa became similarly divided, with some siding with Vichy leadership while others supported the Free French. De Gaulle's reasons for attempting to take control of French West Africa were twofold. He saw the population as a reserve of soldiers to tap into for support in retaking France, and he knew the colonies would pose a threat to the Allies if they fell into Axis hands. He had additional reasons for targeting Dakar, the capital of the former colony of French West Africa and the modern-day capital of Senegal. Before the Vichy conquest of Dakar, Belgium, Poland, and France had transferred their gold reserves there. By gaining control of the territory, the Allies would secure critical economic assets. Dakar was also a major port city, and de Gaulle saw it as an entry point to achieving power over more far-flung territories. 
In a mission codenamed Operation Menace, he teamed up with British military commanders in a plot to capture Dhaka, the capital of the former colony of French West Africa and the modern-day capital of Senegal. A joint British and French detachment was dispatched to carry out the mission in early July. At first, they avoided physical combat. De Gaulle was fairly confident that he could persuade the Vichy forces and Dakar to join in the fight against the Nazis without resorting to violence. But he overestimated his abilities and the invasion was messy from the beginning. De Gaulle's troops made an amphibious approach despite being completely untrained in amphibious warfare and they were met with immediate gunfire from the soldiers at Dakar's naval base, who refused to back down at all costs. It quickly became evident that the Vichy forces were not going to allow the Allied invaders to come ashore without fiercely resisting their entry. The fighting in Dakar continued into the night, and the Free French and British began to wonder if they should withdraw. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill instructed them to stop at nothing and fight to the end but the Vichy forces proved to be tougher than anyone had anticipated, and the Allied losses were accumulating. At that point, de Gaulle realized that the only options were to intensify the attack, which would put civilian lives at risk, or to accept defeat and leave despite Churchill's insistence on continued fighting. The battle was clearly a lost cause for the Allies, and they retreated. They later learned that the Vichy governor had felt similarly about how things were going from their side of the battle, and was considering surrendering before the Allies left. For the British, Operation Menace was a humiliating failure. De Gaulle felt the same way. The failed attempt at capturing Dakar exposed his strategic shortcomings and damaged his standing among the Allies. Even after a subsequent victory at the Battle of Gabon later that year, de Gaulle had failed to wholly repair the damage to his reputation. French West Africa declared its loyalty to Vichy France following the disastrous Dakar raid. Despite the setback, de Gaulle continued campaigning for free French support. He established a base in Cameroon, and within two years, all but one of France's African colonies were under free French control. The Battle of Dakar happened during a broader Allied effort known as the North African Campaign, which lasted from June of 1940 to May of 1943. Following the failed invasion, the Allies launched an invasion into French North Africa known as Operation Torch. In addition to the objective of recapturing Vichy-occupied territories, the operation gave US forces a chance to engage in limited-scale battles against the Germans. Operation Torch began on November 8, 1940, with a three-pronged attack on the coastal cities of Casablanca, Oran, and Algiers. The Allies achieved quick victory despite meeting some fierce resistance at the beginning of the invasions, and within eight days, it was clear that the Vichy forces were at a major disadvantage. In exchange for his cooperation, Vichy French Force Commander Admiral François Darlan was installed as High Commissioner of the new controlling Free French, and many Vichy officials also kept their jobs. He was assassinated soon after the transfer of power from the Vichy to the Free French took place, and former Vichy officials were gradually replaced with free French leaders. While Dakar remained under Vichy control, the Allied victory over Morocco and Algeria was a major blow to the Vichy regime and to the Axis powers in general. The importance of Operation Torch in the Allied war effort has historically been overlooked in popular narratives and teachings of World War II. In addition to its short-term effects, the operation also laid the groundwork for post-war U.S. policy in the Middle East. 1. Aleutian Islands Campaign In June of 1942, a small Japanese force occupying the remote and sparsely populated islands of Atu and Kiska in Alaska's Aleutian Islands. At first glance, it's hard to understand how these barren volcanic landmasses, which are known for their challenging terrain and unforgiving climate, could be of any strategic value. Here, one can expect to routinely encounter thick fog, high winds, bitter cold, and frequent rain and snow. Japan attacked the Aleutian Islands, partially as a diversionary tactic, hoping to draw US forces away from Midway Atoll so the Japanese would have an easier time taking the island. They also believed taking the Aleutians would prevent the US from waging an attack across the northern Pacific. 
to the Americans, the presence of a Japanese base in Alaska represented the threat of future attacks on major West Coast cities like Anchorage, Seattle, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. In the first attack on the continental US in 130 years, Japan initiated the campaign with a two-day aerial bombing of the US Army Air Force Base at Dutch Harbor on Unalaska Island. Little damage was done to the base thanks to the swift response of the American military. A few days later, the Japanese inflicted a second, much more organized air attack and consequently caused a lot more damage. American forces located the nearby Japanese aircraft carriers, but bad weather prevented them from counterattacking. Hindered from any further action at Dutch Harbor due to the weather, the Japanese occupied the islands of Attu and Kiska. At first, American military officials paid relatively little attention to their presence. They were more focused on other aspects of the war, like preparing for combat in Europe and the South Pacific. In the initial aftermath of Japan's invasion of Attu and Kiska, the US response consisted of little more than occasional bombings. Two months after the invasion, the US built an airbase on nearby Adak Island and began attacking the Japanese at Kiska and patrolling the area with submarines and ships. Throughout the campaign, the Americans evacuated indigenous villages in the Aleutians that were home to the Unangaks, also known as the Aleuts. Nearly 900 people were forced onto ships and relocated to the cramped confines of so-called duration villages throughout Alaska. Each person was only allowed to take one suitcase of belongings, and they watched as U.S. servicemen lit their churches, homes, and other buildings on fire to prevent them from falling into Japanese hands. Authorities told indigenous communities that they were being moved for their safety, but the inhumane conditions they suffered at their makeshift camps felt anything but safe. People were placed in abandoned canneries, mining camps, and other dilapidated buildings that lacked electricity and plumbing. The food and water were dirty and inadequate, and residents lacked proper winter clothing. They defied the military's attempts to cut them off from contact with nearby villages and towns and got jobs so they could earn money and upgrade their living conditions. The Japanese also relocated the Unangangs people moving Attu's residents to internment camps in Southeast Asia. American forces attempted to retake Attu in May of 1943, amid inclement weather and with malfunctioning equipment. Troops also lacked sufficient landing vehicles and beaches to land on, and were therefore unable to bring all their cold weather equipment to shore. Their vehicles couldn't operate on the tundra, preventing soldiers from getting where they needed to go, and many suffered from frostbite. The fighting continued for nearly 20 days before ending with an American victory. More US soldiers were harmed by the effects of the severe cold than anything else, with around 1,200 suffering weather-related injuries. An estimated 1,148 were wounded in combat, 614 succumbed to disease, and 549 died in combat. From Attu, the Americans proceeded to Kiska accompanied by Canadian troops, unaware that the Japanese had evacuated. In fact, they had left two weeks earlier unnoticed, fleeing under the cover of fog. The US military managed to decode Japanese correspondence detailing the abandonment of Kiska, yet the Americans continued to attack the deserted base for three weeks in a campaign known as Operation Cottage. During their time there, they faced an equally harsh environment to the one they encountered on Attu. Despite no combat taking place, 313 troops died for various reasons, including friendly fire, disease, booby traps and bombs left behind by the Japanese, vehicle accidents, and frostbite. Japan's invasion of Alaska came as a shock to the American people, who couldn't believe that the Japanese had managed to take over land on US soil. In the years since, the Aleutian Islands campaign has been overshadowed by other major events from the conflict earning it the nickname of the Forgotten Battle and the Forgotten Front. But the Aleutian campaign wasn't inconsequential. In hindsight, there's no saying what might have happened if the US had lost one of its own territories to the Japanese. The experience in the Aleutians also gave the Americans a preview of the island-hopping battles that would continue throughout the Pacific for the duration of the war. Thanks for watching. In your opinion, which one of these battles helped war efforts the most? Tell us in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe. 
See you soon. Bye.